All right. Good to see you guys. Thank you for getting up on this beautiful Sunday morning and coming out and sharing your time with us. I love you guys. I love being able to worship with y'all, be able to bring the word and share in this time together. Um, Thomas came up with a prayer request this morning uh, for his mom, Kelly, and I know a lot of people uh, struggle with like sleep apnea, and so whenever whenever you're trying to sleep, it's really hard to breathe, and that can be really scary. I, I've got some really good friends that uh, that have have had to deal with that, um, but you know, there's there's something that that can really scare people if their family's going through something. You know, I think I've probably shared about how I've how scared I was whenever Kyrie, uh, when she was little, she would struggle with asthma really bad and couldn't breathe, you know? And it's, I mean, I would have traded places with her in a heartbeat, you know what I mean? I would have taken that from her gladly, gladly, in, in a split second. And whenever our families struggle with things, it's considerably harder for us than if we struggle with it. It can be scary whenever we struggle with things too, but... But having a having our family struggle with those things that's really uh, really scary. So um, let's just pray for Kelly this morning, okay? And just um, remember who we're talking to. Remember who we're talking to whenever we pray for her. Jesus. He looks up to heaven and he says, "Father, thank you for hearing my prayers." Because he knows that his father hears his prayers. And we are God's children. We're not, we're not slaves. We're his children. And think about it. Think about if your children are asking you, aren't you going to be faithful? Aren't you going to give to them, especially if it's something that they need, if it's something that they're struggling with? Just like if I could take that from Kyrie immediately, I would have taken it from her. God wants to take our hurts. He wants to take the things that burden us, the things that that cause fear. He doesn't want us to have fear. He doesn't want us to have anxiety. He doesn't want us to struggle with physical illnesses. And Jesus is our example of that. Do we struggle with with illnesses and sicknesses and things in this world? Yes, because we live in a fallen world. Did he tell us to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to cast out demons? Yes. Did he tell us that it's better that the Holy Spirit would come so that we can do those things? Yes. He's commissioned us to do it. It's not something that he recommended. It's something that he told us to do. And he wants us to do it, to build up our faith. He knows that one day we are going to leave this world, whether it's uh, from sickness or, or old age or an accident or whatever. One day we're going to. But he wants us to heal the sick so that it will build up our most holy faith, so that we'll remember who it is that we're talking to. We'll remember his power. And we'll walk out and do the things that scare us because he goes before us and he prepares the way for us. Okay, so thank you, Thomas, for coming up and asking me to to lead us in prayer over Kelly. So if you're around Kelly right there, if you would just lay your hands on her. And like I said, remember who we're talking to. Remember who gives you the power to do this. So Holy Father... Lord, thank you, God, that you do hear our prayers. Thank you, God, that you want us to call on your name and that you will hear our prayers and that you will heal us. Lord, so we just pray for Kelly right now. We speak to her body and we tell her body to be healed, that this this struggling breathing at night whenever she sleeps will be removed from her midst, Lord. We pray that the fear will be removed from her midst. 
We pray that as she's healed from this, God, that you will empower her to go about and heal other people that are struggling with the same thing so that you will get the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, for her complete healing. Thank you, God, for the trust and the faith and the hope that we put in you. Thank you, God, that you allow us to walk forth and do what you've commanded us to do in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. We're going to cover verses 25 through 29. 25 through 29. The message for today, the title for the message today is Go and Do Likewise. Go and Do Likewise. This message today is going to cover a portion of what God wants for us on how to live for eternal life. On how to live for eternal life. All of us want to live forever, and in fact, all of us are going to live forever. We're going to do that because we've got a spirit that's inside of us. God breathed His breath of life into us and gave us His Spirit. We're not like any other animal, any other creature on the planet because we're created in His image and in His likeness. And because of that, we will live forever, whether it's in heaven or whether it's in hell. There's a lot of people that don't believe in hell. They don't want to believe that there's a hell. That's rough. That's rough. I mean, it's, it's, wouldn't we all like to think that there is, is no place called hell? Maybe. But if there is no place called hell, there would be no place called heaven. And we wouldn't have an opportunity to spend all of eternity with God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who loves us so deeply. Hell has got to be the separation of us from God. It's got to be absolutely devastating. But the Word does clearly tell us that there is a hell, that is, it is separated by a chasm, and it is a lake of fire. I think I better set a timer. There's a good chance if I keep going like this, we might be here for the rest of the day. If we do end up running long, and you have somewhere to be, you can feel free to leave. I don't think that we will, and hopefully no one will fall asleep and fall out of a window and die, and we have to raise them from the dead like Paul, but if so, then so be it. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Holy Spirit, God, empower us to be able to go and do likewise to follow your commands and live the way that you've called us to live in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, so Brittany is now a grandmother. She is. to an absolutely gorgeous granddaughter. And yes, that would make me still her husband um, and, and a grandpa. I was told yesterday, though, that if they didn't, if this person didn't know me, they would never think that I was old enough to be a grandpa. I said, yeah, I agree with that. But she is gorgeous. So gorgeous. Tinley Adeline. She was born on Thursday at about 9.22 p.m. And uh, what a joy. What an absolute joy. Any grandparents in here? A few of you? Do you know what's up? You know what's up? The rest of you, you'll get there. Like I said, we're going to start in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 29. And I kind of want to set a stage for you here. I, maybe I should stand still. I'm starting to... I want to set a stage for you here. Jesus, he went from town to town teaching and preaching in the synagogues. A synagogue is not the temple 
It's a place where people would get together, they would talk about the Word, they would, they would have discussion back and forth, some, some uh, conversations. Jesus got in trouble all the time for healing sick people on the Sabbath in the synagogues because they didn't think that He should work um, by speaking. I don't know. Seems a little odd to me, but He did. This, this, this passage is only found in Luke. It's not found in the other uh, Gospels. And it's about the Good Samaritan. So I'm sure everybody's heard about the Good Samaritan a thousand times, and I get it. But so had I, and whenever I was reading through this, there's sometimes there's just things that just pop out, you know, and they just really grab a hold of you. And so... Those things I wanted to highlight and kind of bring out to you guys as well. So, Jesus, where he is right now, he had just sent out the 72 disciples in all these different places and told them to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons, and they did. They come back super excited. They're like, you wouldn't believe this. And he's like, yes, I would, because I told you to do it. But they had done all these things. They're, they're mega excited. And then it says, and then sometime later, Jesus is, is speaking, and an expert in the Jewish and Mosaic rabbinical laws um asked him a question, but he didn't just ask him a question. It says that he stood up and asked him a question. So oftentimes, whenever they were in synagogue and whoever was teaching or preaching would be standing up in front of everybody, they'd read from the scrolls and stuff like that. Everybody else is kind of sitting down because it takes a while. Well, this expert in the law stands up and asks Jesus a question. Could this have been a Pharisee or a Sadducee or maybe just a, a Levite? Yes. All of the, it could have been any of those. I have my own opinions on it, and I'll get into my opinion here in a little bit and explain why. But I think that it was most likely a Levite, just a a Levite who is basically like a lawyer. He's an expert in the law. People come to him to lay out the law for him. So let me read through this real quick 25 through 29. Luke chapter 10 says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood to test Jesus. And he says, Teacher, he asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response is priceless here. He says, What is written in the law? And how do you read it? How do you interpret it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Remember, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do this and you will live. But he, the religious or the um, uh, expert in Jewish law, He wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So this whole whole story here of the Good Samaritan is brought on because this guy wants to know who is my neighbor. He wants to know for sure so that he can follow that to a T, because that's what he does. Jesus says, A man was going down from Jerusalem... To Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. 
And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Remember, the dude's half dead. Put him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. He said to him, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus looks at him and says, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Go and do that same thing. This man, this expert in the law, really, really surprised me. Honestly, totally surprised me. First off, it says that he stands up and he asked him a question to test him. Well, naturally, we all think, yeah, the, the religious leaders, they were constantly trying to test Jesus to catch him in something. Well, the word here, test, in its original language, it could mean that, but more likely, it was probably a sincere question. The way I've always taken it was it was sarcastic, and it was him being just like the rest of them, trying to catch Jesus in something so that they could use it against him. But think of this. Here's kind of what got me thinking about this differently, and I had to look up the word test, and I had to dig into it a little bit more, because the man answered correctly when Jesus, when he's asking Jesus, what must I do? Out of all the law, the hundreds and hundreds of rules that they have to follow, look at what the man chose. Look at how he chose to respond to Jesus. This is different than what anybody else that would have been trying to capture him, would have responded, honestly. So it kind of got me thinking about it a little bit. And then he says, he calls him teacher. Now, lots of people called him teacher. Even some of the Pharisees and Sadducees at the time, whenever they would want to get him in an argument or trap him, they would call him teacher, which back then he didn't go through all the schooling and stuff like Paul did, you know, Saul under Gamaliel and all that, he didn't go through all those things. Yet he had this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding. He's in the temple at 12, you know, talking to the high priest and stuff, and they were blown away by him. He didn't go through all these things. So it's not, it's not likely that they would have called him teacher, the religious leaders and stuff, unless they truly respected him or unless they, were, they did not respect him and they were trying to disrespect him by calling him that. I feel like that there's a good chance that he respected him at this point. But look at the question that he, he poses to Jesus. He said, what must I do to inherit? And he says, what must I do? He's already an expert. They considered him one of the best, you know, an expert who studied and knew the law inside and out. Look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They all thought that they were way way better. Like even whenever they're going in and they're praying and, and the one is praying with the tax collector in there and, and he's saying, thank you, God, that I'm not like even this tax collector. You know, he was haughty and proud, puffed up. This guy, he's asking Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He knows that there's eternal life, but he wants to make sure that he does what he's supposed to do. What must I do? He's not saying, what, what should these people do? What should I do? What's the key to inherit eternal life? Inherit. Think about that term, inherit. If you inherit 
you know, your, your family farm. You inherit things from, from your family. It's yours. It's given to you. You own it. You have it. It's expected that it's going to be yours. If he's this religious leader, if he's this expert in the law, he had to have been a Jew. He had to have been within the right um, bloodline to be able to be, um, to be allowed to go to school to become this expert. So he probably felt that he was supposed to have it anyway. That's how most of them felt at that time. But he takes the time to stand up and ask Jesus, what must I do? They've seen a lot of things at this point too, by the way. Jesus has proven himself and who he is and his power and his authority. At this point, they can choose to believe or not believe. So I'm not saying that 100% that this guy had a pure heart in, in asking these questions. He may or may not have. But it's interesting to look at it from multiple perspectives at least. Jesus' response, though, I love it. It's true Jesus. He asks him a question instead of answering his question for him. He wants people to think on their own. Isn't it so easy to just tell people what you think, especially when they ask you a question? You're like, well, oh, good. Now I get an opportunity to share my wisdom, my knowledge, my understanding, and I get to hopefully twist the way people think with my own understanding. Jesus didn't do that. He says, what's the law already say? You're an expert in the law. What does it say? And then, then he says, how do you read it? How do you interpret what it says? Because there's a big difference. You know, Jesus called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs. He called them out time and time again because of what they felt about themselves and how they interpreted the law wrong. Or even if they did interpret it correctly, they still delivered it wrong to bring glory and honor on themselves and not on God. To take care of them and not take care of the flock, not take care of people. That's why Jesus had to come at that time because it had gotten so bad in the first place. That's why he came right then. So he says, how do you read it? How do you interpret what the law says? And then the man, this is, this is what I love. He, he picks scripture out of Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and out of Leviticus 19 verse 18 and lays those out out of all the, out of all the law. He picks these two verses. Let me, let me read to you what they say. 6.5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. That's what this man chose to pick, to read. And then in Leviticus 19.18, he says, he takes the last half of it. Then the full verse is, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Has anybody ever read Leviticus before? There, there's a lot in there. If you've ever read Deuteronomy, there's a lot in there. These are the ones that this guy chooses. And Jesus says, you answered correctly. Jesus tells him. <laughs> That's awesome. You answered right. Finally, somebody gets it. You know? You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. That's what he's asking. What do I need to do? We also have Jesus telling people that, um, that if we love God and we believe in him, we will not perish. 
but we will have everlasting life, right? John 3.16. This is the same thing, only kind of in a little different wording. It's the same thing, though. He's telling him, wow, you, you understand. So, but then the guy, and the word says that he wanted to justify himself. So justify, if I want to justify, it's like I want to justify my actions, right? This guy, he wanted to make sure that he was doing what he was supposed to do. And so basically it's just to be clear, who's my neighbor? Think about all the history that the Jewish people have gone through from Abraham all the way up. All the times they've been attacked, they've been They've been taken off into slavery. At this point, they've been scattered all over the world. And he's like, who's my neighbor? You know, because right here to the north, uh, to the northwest, we've got the Samaritans. They're part Jew. We'll get into that here in a minute. We don't really get along with them. We sure don't get along with anybody to our south down in Egypt. You know, they've tried to kill all of our kids a bunch of times, like, We've been taken off into slavery. Who, who's my neighbor? Can you, please, can you please lay that out for me? And so Jesus does. He lays it out. In a reply, he says, and a man, which this would be a Jewish man. So his, his response is being directed to him as, as someone that these guys should have stopped to help. He's a man. It, he could have said, your average, your typical Jewish man. He's laying there, and they're going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Nowadays, like Missouri is up here, and Texas, we say, is down in Texas because it's south from here. Well, in this, if you went from Jerusalem to Jericho, you would technically be going northeast, but Jerusalem was up here in the mountains, and he's going down the mountain path toward Jericho but it's still northeast. Um, Basically, straight across, I'm trying to do this to where you guys see it properly in my mind. So you have Jericho here, Jerusalem's here, Samaria is here. It's a big big area north of Jerusalem. There's no reason that the Samaritan technically would be going down the path from Jerusalem to Jericho. It wouldn't have ended up well for him, even if there weren't robbers. If there were just um, just Jews, it wouldn't have ended up well for him. But then he says, this man is going down this path when he's attacked by robbers. I want you to think about that word robbers and what that means to you. It says they stripped him of his clothes, so they took all of his clothes off. That's embarrassing beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So what does that robber sound to you like? Sounds to me like Satan, because he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. And this man fell into the hands of these robbers. This Jewish man fell into their hands. It says a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man... He saw him and made a conscious decision to go around. He saw somebody in need, somebody hurt, a Jewish man that had been beaten, broken, stolen from, and half dead. And if he didn't do anything about it, the guy's going to die. He's half dead already. Nobody's on this route. And he goes around him. Here's what's rough, guys. Priests. They were designated by God to be his representative here on this earth. To love the people. To show them God's attributes. Who he is. That's what a priest was called to do. Jesus is saying this is not what the priests are doing. This is what's happening. They're going around. They don't even want to talk to him. They don't want to see him. They don't want to dirty themselves, because they're so fixated on themselves that he goes around. And then he says, so too 
a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Why would Jesus make this, this differentiation between the priest and the Levite? The Levites, let me tell you a little bit about Levites, okay? This tribe, they were bad to the bone. They were straight up bad to the bone, honestly. Levites were a holy people. They were set aside by God to lead people in worship. Remember King David, how he was basically the lead worshiper? Whenever he's coming into the, into the city, he's got the, the Ark of the Covenant with him. He's coming in and he's worshiping extravagantly. Wasn't he one of the most bad of the bone dudes that ever lived too? Straight up warrior, hardcore warrior. Well, listen to when the Levites got selected and how they got selected to be the chosen people that they were. This is pretty wild, so hold on to your seats. And I didn't write this. God did. It's in the Bible, okay? So I'm just throwing out that disclaimer. Sometimes I get a little over the top, but this isn't even from me. If you look at Exodus 32, verses 25 through 29, you're going to read a pretty insane story. It's pretty rough. I'm going to read some of it and paraphrase some of it for you. So... I'll break down the timeline for you. Moses is up on the mountain praying to God. He's been up there for a long, stinking time, over a month. He's getting the Ten Commandments, which aren't a bunch of laws of you, you must do this. It's if you do this, you're going to be blessed. That's how we've got to look at the Ten Commandments. That's how God meant it. He's getting the Ten Commandments. But he's been gone so long that the people are like, Moses must not be coming back. Honestly, the Israelites, they, uh, they started this probably about three minutes after they couldn't see him anymore. But, but uh, that's their, their attention span here. But anyhow, so he's up there. They start grumbling, and they come to Aaron, and they say, Hey, dude, we don't know where Moses is anymore. We want you to make us an idol to be able to worship. They were just led out of, out of Egypt. Red Sea parts, manna from heaven, fire leading them by night, cloud by day. Their clothes aren't wearing out. I mean, you know, naturally they need an idol to worship, right? While Moses isn't there. They're still getting all these things, though, by the way. So they come and they tell Aaron, make this idol for us. And after enough persuasion, he says, well, give me all your gold. He melts down all their gold. They were given all this gold from from the Egyptians that by this point they're like, take it all and get out of here. So he takes all this gold and he makes this nice, pretty golden calf. Nice job, Aaron. Real nice. And then Moses comes down, sees what's going on. He gets all kinds of upset, naturally. Throws down the Ten Commandments, breaks them. He goes and he's calling an account for this. He's calling them to account. And Moses, picking up in the latter part of verse 25, 26, something like that, he says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me, and all the Levites rallied around him. We got tons and tons and tons and tons of people out here, hundreds of thousands, maybe maybe millions. And it says all the Levites, Moses is standing there at the entrance of the camp and says, whoever's for the Lord, come to me. And a bunch of the Levites come rallying around him. So he gets their attention. Everybody else is still out doing their own stupid thing, worshiping these idols and and doing their own thing. They weren't even listening to Moses at this point. Basically, they'd forgotten about Moses. Whatever, you've been gone for a while. I don't even know who you are. He says, this is what the Lord said. This is Moses speaking. This is what the Lord said, the God of Israel. Each man strap on a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. Whoa, that took a sharp turn quickly, didn't it? 
put your swords on, go kill your friends and family. Anybody that's not worshiping God and that's worshiping these idols, take them out, kill them. This is what the Lord God said. And there was a reason he said that. Because oh, how quickly we fall out of sight of God and what he wants and what he desires. He wants what's best for us. He desires what's best for us. He is God, the God, the one and only God. That golden calf is not God. And if mm. So, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and his friend and his neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded that day, and about 3,000 of the people died. They obeyed. They said, I will do what you tell me to do, God. They obeyed, even so much so as to kill their own friends and family because they would not follow God. That is how God chose these people. Then Moses said, listen to this, okay? Take what you were just thinking, set it aside for a second. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today. For you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. You were obedient, and you have been blessed. You have been set apart. You have been called apart by God because of your obedience and your willingness to follow me above and beyond anything, even your own personal wants, needs, and desires. And you will be blessed because of it. So these Levites, what they had become... What they became at that point is they were musicians. They were the lead worshipers. They led people um, at this point around the Ark of the Covenant with uh, worship in the tent uh, of meeting. They were in there all the time. They were the gatekeepers. They were the guardians. They were judges. They were temple officials. And they were craftsmen. They weren't just craftsmen. They were God's craftsmen the ones that made everything for the temple, made everything um, designing the, the, um, the tent and the curtains and the everything. They were the craftsmen. They were the ones that created everything that God told them to create. Do you guys remember Obed-Edom? This dude's super cool. He's got this farm. I think I've probably talked about him before, but he was a Levite. And whenever the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant, they took it in battle which was really crazy because then all of a sudden God starts breaking loose in their camp, um, defiles their, their God, Dagon, a couple times. They start getting these sores, these, these growths and stuff like that. Rats are coming in, eating everything. It's like, we got to get rid of this thinking ark. Like, we should have never taken this thing. So they send it back. Well, where these cows take it is to Obed-Edom's house. Obed-Edom is a Levite. One of these people. And he, the ark stays there, and he's been, he's been blessed. So then they tell David, they tell him, Hey, man, the ark of the covenant's over at Obed-Edom's house, and he's been blessed like crazy. It's not with the Philistines anymore. David said, Let's go get it. So they go get it. They're taking it back. But they didn't just take it from Obed and leave him there. They took it, and then David appointed him as all of these things, as one of the lead worshipers, as a gatekeeper, as a protector, as a judge, and it starts listing all these things out that he does. If you read, it's kind of shotgun blasted out through there, but if you pick them all out, it's like, wow, this dude had a wild life after he ended up getting the Ark of the Covenant. He seriously did. Super cool. But he was a Levite. So the Samaritan, though. Let's look at the Samaritan. So now... The priest goes on the other side. The Levite goes out of his way, which is designated to take care of these people. That's his job, a protector. He should have been doing it, and he wasn't. But then there's a Samaritan. And as he travels, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. A Samaritan, to, to the Jews, was considered a half-breed. They were not a pure race anymore, because whenever they had been taken into captivity and they started making their way back, they settled in the region of Samaria, 
and they started worshiping God and other gods. So they were intermarrying with all these other types of people and stuff. They're worshiping all these different kinds of gods, and the Jews did not like that at all. In fact, they went and ripped down, destroyed their temple, their temple that was actually to God, to the real God. They destroyed it. That really put a bad taste in the Samaritans' mouths toward the Jews, and they were just in constant battle with each other. This, Whenever we just read this at face value and we don't look at the context of what we're talking about here, it just isn't real, really that, that big of a deal, right? But whenever we realize who it is that we're talking about, who God's talking about here, and, and how drastic of, of everything that was really going on, you bring it into perspective. The Jews literally considered Samaritans lower than dogs. That's why we have the woman at the well in Samaria, and that whole story is so incredible. It's, because, it's not just because Jesus shouldn't have been talking to a woman at that point by himself. It's because he was talking to a Samaritan woman at that point. They didn't even want to go into Samaria. They wanted to go around Samaria. They didn't even want to be anywhere by there because Jews and Samaritans did not mix. That's why it's so wild that this Samaritan Jesus is talking about is on that same path, is on the same road as you. And you guys went around, and here's this Samaritan that shouldn't have even been there, but he's there. And he's the one that takes pity on a Jew. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He gets off the donkey, puts the man on his own donkey, and allows the donkey to carry him, and that man walked. That man walked the rest of the way to the end. He was, he was literally putting himself aside, lowering himself, elevating this man. Puts him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, and pays for him to stay there. It says the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Most people don't know what denarii is. Most people don't take the time to look up what, the, what money value is that. One denarii is how much a, one, a, a day laborer, say somebody going out in the field and cutting down you know, grain or whatever, going out and plowing, if they worked all day, they would get one denarii. So he pays two denarii, two full days worth of wages, to this innkeeper to take care of this guy. Goes out of his way, gives his money, and then says the next day, whatever else you have to spend, put it on my bill. I'm going to come back and I'm going to pay for it. That would have been mind-blowing to the innkeeper, knowing that this man's a Samaritan and this man's a Jew. Like, what? What? This is unheard of. Jesus is making a very significant point here. He's changing up the way people think about things. Changing up their worldview. And remember what the whole point is. Remember what the man asked. How do I in inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go and do this. Keep in mind, this is what he's telling him to do. Then Jesus, again, so he tells a story. He doesn't answer a question. He, he asks him two more questions, tells a story, and now he asks him another question. Which one of these three... The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers. Which one was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? He, didn't say, he never said, who lives close to somebody? This is my next door neighbor. He didn't say, this person is another Jew, so naturally he's, he's your neighbor. He said, who's in need? Who do you see is in need? Who needs something? Who needs you, what you can do for them? That's your neighbor. He asked him, which one of these three was his neighbor? 
And the man again answers correctly. Answers correctly. He says, it says, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Imagine having to to stomach your pride, because if you are an expert in the law, then you're either a Levite or you are a priest, a Pharisee, a Sadducee, a religious leader. You are one of those. And he's talking to one of those, and this man had to stomach his pride. He had to swallow it, because Jesus said, this is what these people would do. Which one's a neighbor? And he makes him speak it out of his mouth. The one who showed mercy on him. He didn't say the Samaritan, but at least he said the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, yes. Yes, you're correct. That is exactly right. I don't care if it's a Jew or a Gentile, a Samaritan that you consider lower than dogs. I don't care who it is. If they need help, if it's somebody that can use You, if you can give them what they need to live, then they're your neighbor. If you see them do it, that's your neighbor. And Jesus says, go, go and do likewise. Go and do the same thing. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, go and do this very same thing. For us, guys, the the Bible is literally written to us as a roadmap, as a love letter, as instructions, as a guide, as the living, breathing Word of God to us. Are there things that can be taken out of context? Yes. But let me ask you a question. Do you feel like that Jesus... Put this in Luke just for that man? Or did he put it in there for me and you too? So if this is what he tells this man to do, and we're supposed to take this word, get it rooted deep inside our hearts, and live this word, if we're supposed to be like Christ, we're supposed to look like Him, we're supposed to represent Him, we're supposed to be His hands and His feet and His mouthpiece, then should we walk on the other side of the road when we see somebody in need? Should we ignore people in need? If it makes us feel uncomfortable to talk to them, should we talk to them and share the Word of God with them? If it costs us money, if it costs us time, should we share with them? Should we be a neighbor to them? Let me ask you another question. Do you want to inherit eternal life? These things can be, they can be tough. But following Christ, it's not a cakewalk. It's not going to be easy. It requires something from you. You will receive in return. But you will receive pressed down, shaken together, and running over what you give. And if you walk right by the person in need and you don't tell them about Christ, you don't give them what they need, then when you're in need, people are going to walk right by you. It's going to be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But please hear me today. This is not about do. This is not about you going out and spending all of your energy and efforts and and giving all of your time and your money and everything to everybody just to earn this way in. It's 
not what this is about. You can't do any of these things on your own. I can't do any of these things on my own unless God empowers me to do it. I can't. And the only way that he's going to empower me to do it and empower you to do it is to keep your eyes fixed on him, to want more of him, to need more of him, desire more of him, go after more of him. And whenever you do, you won't care about any of the other stuff, the time that it takes, the money that it takes, everything. None of that's going to matter because he's all that matters. And because he's all that matters, you're going to love these people so very much that you have his love for you, for them, in your heart. One of the One of the great, great, great worship songs is break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything that I am for your kingdom, Lord. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Jesus told this because his heart breaks for people that are beaten, robbed, abused, stolen from. It breaks his heart. It should absolutely break our hearts. We shouldn't look at people that are begging and in need and all these things and, and be disgusted because Jesus doesn't look at them and is disgusted. He looks at his children, his children. The only reason that you're seeing a beggar and not you where that beggar is is one decision. We're all just one decision away from being in that same spot, needing that same mercy, that same love, that same care, that same compassion. We're one decision away. It's by the, but by the grace of God that we are where we are and who we are. That's it. But all it would take is one decision to be that person. That's it. God calls us to love, love others. You know, at the end of of John's life, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who Jesus looks down off of the cross and says, woman, behold your son. It's not, it wasn't her biological son. It was the disciple, John. And he says, behold your mother. He's the only one that wasn't, that didn't die from the persecution that all the rest of the disciples died from. It wasn't for lack of trying. He was boiled alive and stoned and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like he absolutely could have and should have died. And maybe he did die and God just brought him back to life and let him die, you know, an old, an old life. And it's like, oh, well, he had it good. No, he didn't. He watched all of his friends be murdered and tortured and killed. No, he didn't have it good. He didn't. But he said at the end of his life, Toward, the very, toward most of the end of his ministry, he would just tell people, love others, and the rest of it will take care of itself. That's what he told them. That's what he would preach. At the end of his life, he had preached all these things. He had built up churches. He was a solid foundational part of building up the Christian faith. And at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry, What he was preaching was love others, and the rest of it will take care of itself. Love people. But we have to get in our minds, what is love? What is truly loving people? If you're focused on God, and you say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours, then you're going to love people. That's just the way it is. Ask, and you will receive. We're supposed to pray for one another. We're supposed to care for their needs just as Jesus would. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what I encourage all of you to do. I ask you guys to pray for me that I would do that better, that I would do it more, that I would do it better, that I would keep my eyes fixed on him, and that the silly things of this world wouldn't matter to me. If you want to pray for me, that's what I ask you to pray. I'm nothing without him. Nothing. Guys, I love y'all. That's the message that I have for you today. We're going to close in some worship. And if anybody needs prayer for anything, you can come up. If you want to get around one another and pray for one another, do that. 
But guys, take this word this week and ponder it. Think about it. Let it, let it meditate in your heart. Meditate on it in your heart.